Hello. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here in this World Bank conference to speak about the perspectives for growth for Latin America and the Caribbean and one of their biggest challenges when it comes to development, which is the digital inclusive transformation. My name is Gabriela Frias and I will be moderating this conversation. Yesterday, the economic office of the World Bank presented the regional paper, which is published before the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank to update the growth perspectives for the region and also to speak about the challenges ahead. This year, this report is also analyzing the channel challenges for the digital inclusiveness. And today we have Will Maloney, Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean for the World Bank. We also have here Eleonora Rabinovich. She is the head of the government affairs and public policy for Spanish speaking LATAM for Google. And also Yolanda Martinez, who is the program lead for the GovStack initiative from the International Telecommunications Union. Welcome. And we will begin with the macro scenario to understand the macroeconomic perspective. Bill, we have spoken about the economic perspectives that were presented yesterday. There is a regional uh, GDP of 2%, but we are very much below other regions, right? Thank you, Gabriela. Exactly the case. The good news is that we are doing better than we expected six months ago. Uh, we have 2% this year, 3% next year, 6% the year after, which is insufficient in order to promote social mobility and eliminate poverty. But it's almost similar to what we had in 2010 when we were growing at 2% rate. So. There is something that goes beyond to the global uh, moment that we are living that is stopping us and we need to check what structural changes we need to make possible growth. And where are those gaps nowadays? There are several. It's very important to realize that it's not only about growth. We have identified several areas that are relevant. We have less trade, which was expected due to our uh, trade agreements and uh, difficulties in big markets. And with the different uh, situations derived from the COVID-19, the problem with the global uh, value chains, we have a foreign investment proceed similar to what we had 10 years ago, somehow we're not harnessing the international context that we have at the time being, and it's part of the same problem of the low levels of growth. We are seeing a migration of uh, gaps. We continue with uh, structural development that is lower to regions that are similar to our region in terms of uh, human capital. We lack qualified workforce, according to what the business people say, but uh, our technicians and engineers, we still need to develop uh, um, human talent. So it's very important to keep a stable uh, rules of the game and that are easily understood by all the stakeholders because there are be there are plenty of doubt about where the economies are headed to so we have these challenges to consider just to begin with i want to ask about trade i want to understand about the fragmentation in geopolitical terms and how is it affecting latin america when it comes to trade flows up to this moment I haven't seen uh, fragmentation in our experts. We have a uh, division. Mexico continues to be oriented towards the United States 
and the rest of uh, South America is uh, looking at uh, China, and this is an important uh, evolution. But the interesting thing is what's going to happen in the years to come, because we have several countries that may turn into platforms to be near shoring with the United States and Europe. We're speaking about Mexico, Colombia, and others. But in order to harness this opportunity, and the opportunities related to uh, our comparative advantage when it comes to climate change, our super green matrix and our uh, reservoirs of lithium, we need to have a well-articulated vision from the energy standpoints in order to make uh, the most of the situation. That is very important. We want Eleonora and Yolanda to speak about this vision jointly. But we are in a very complex part of the year. And before we go to our two guests, I wanted to ask you whether you can see that we are better off than six months ago, but the global context is still adverse. Please speak to me about the context and what we're seeing immediately for the next few months. And of course, in your opinion, how can our region make the most of the advantages of the digital economy? First, within the global context, the context continued to be adverse for a while, but a good, a good news is that the region has done well in fighting against inflation, excepting some uh, countries. With, uh, we see low levels of inflation, and this is uh, evidence of uh, well-managed economies by fiscal authorities and monetary authorities. But in the developed world, in the G7, we will continue seeing high interest rate and high uh, prices of commodities, they will continue to be high, but nobody knows what's going to happen uh, to China, and that's very important for us. So in the midterm, we have a high degree of uncertainty and low dynamism. Now, with regards to uh, digital economy and connectivity that we uh, have mentioned in our report, we have witnessed uh, several possibilities. There are new industry types, and, and you see uh, growth in unicorns, and precisely unicorns related to digital platforms. There is an opportunity for uh, Latin American countries to uh, harness these opportunities, but it's necessary to do more. Also, digital connectivity enables us to uh, have technology transfer, it's going to help the farmers, and this has an impact in the economy, and this may stimulate growth. Secondly, digital technology can help governments to be more responsive to uh, the needs of people, to be more inclusive, and we saw during the pandemic that even if uh, children were not able to attend physically schools, they could continue their education uh, with e-learning, telemedicine, among other dimensions that technology can help to improve, to improve the um, performance of government. So, the third element is that there are possibilities, systems to carry out uh, purchases, which help the government to reduce uh, expenses, making things more transparent and more efficient. So we estimate that 4% of the GDP can be saved in terms of uh, government efficiency. And this gives the government the opportunity to reassign these resources to other priorities. So there are plenty of possibilities. And uh, we hear the experts saying two things. 
first the possibility of exacerbating inequalities in our, in our economies, it's very likely to occur. The example of uh, education interruptions during COVID-19, there were interruptions of uh, schooling. But however, if I have access to a computer and internet, fine. But if I don't have access, that's a, that's a problem. So in the midterm, we will continue to see a remarkable gap between uh, the wealthy and the poor. The second element I would like to highlight is that this is not a silver bullet. You know, you cannot just wire uh, a place and that's it. No, we need to make an emphasis on the importance of uh, knowledge. The complementary stakeholders need to be there to harness this opportunity, and this requires uh, effort and resources. What you're saying is very important when it comes to making the most of opportunities. 4% of GDP, if we can get technology closer to offer solutions as authorities or government, the situation will worsen before it gets better. But the idea is to use technology to close these gaps. Let us now speak with Eleonora Rabinovich. How are you? With regards to what Bill has said with regards to this diagnosis, how does Google see the evolution of the digitalization in the region, what has been achieved, but also the gaps that you're seeing? Thank you, Gabriela. Good morning. And thank you to the World Bank for inviting us to participate in this conversation speak about this report. The diagnosis that Will made was very interesting and we share many of his perspectives and the perspectives of the paper when it comes to the challenges and the opportunities of digitalization for our region. I want to say that last week Google had its 25th anniversary and we have been in the region for 20 years. We are very enthusiastic with regards to the opportunities that Latin America has when it comes to developing with the digital transformation. For example, in 2021, Latin America was the region with the highest growth for e-commerce with other countries such as Mexico, Argentina and Brazil leading the growth. and. In Google, a few years ago, we wanted to measure the potential of this economic uh, growth that the countries may have due to the digital transformation. And we had a digital sprinters report uh, drafted, which covers many countries in emerging uh, in emerging countries. So the six main economies in Latin America could have an annual of uh, growth of uh, 1.3370 million by using the digital economy. So the impact that this digital transformation may have, according to our report, is very, very strong. So you were asking about the opportunities and the challenges that we see. Of course, there is a big uh, jump in economic indicators in Latin America, but we still have gaps and challenges. The first has to do with access to an internet or connectivity. And although things have improved in the last decade, some countries in our region, in metrics that have to do with internet access is the same as high income countries. There are millions of people who cannot access the internet because they live in rural areas. Uh, so the gap between people who live in urban areas and people who access the internet in rural areas is still very, very unequal. For example, according, we it could be maybe 25% of a gap, and in some cases, even a 40%, which is a very big gap. The second aspect of this has to do with digital skills, because we not only need to have the access to the internet and good connectivity, but we also need to be able to make the most of the technology. And for that access and that utilization of resources may be inclusive and sustainable. This is a crucial subject. 50% of companies, 50% of companies that seek to have formal jobs cannot find 
employees with the right qualifications. And we know that technology will create 10 million new jobs for 2025 in the region. So there is a great opportunity to make the most of those jobs to do with digital technologies. I'd like to mention that a few months ago, we launched the first Latin American index for AI. Uh, and today, this is, of course, the main subject, and I recommend that everybody should read this report. And in that index, one of the discoveries or the findings was that within the main gaps to adopt AI technology has to do with the talent development, the availability of human capital. So there is a big opportunity here to work jointly, companies with the private sector, with multilateral organizations and with civil society in order to expand human capital in our region. Obviously, the region can also move forward when it comes to designing public policies to support the digital ecosystem. For example, the cloud first policies and that have a lot to do with the digital transformation within the countries to offer more modern services, to be able to have better communication with citizens and uh, more efficient governments. Uh, the approach to these opportunities and these challenges need joint uh, effort. Companies can't do it on their own, neither can states nor the multilateral organizations. We must all work together. And last year, and you were uh, a witness of that when we had uh, the meeting, our CEO announced a commitment to invest in the region in the next five years of 1.2 billion dollars uh, and together with other stakeholders we can help the region by digital infrastructure digital skills an entrepreneurial ecosystem and opportunities that are sustainable and inclusive we've been working and investing in the region uh, with submarine cables and data centers and cloud regions, and we are supporting the expansion of digital skills through many programs and initiatives that I might mention later on. And we know that if we keep working jointly with governments and with multilateral organizations, we will be able to advance the region when it comes to digital transformation, which will bring us so many benefits in Latin America. This is very important, Eleonora, thank you very much. Uh, just what you mentioned with regards to the amount, $1.3 billion, you were speaking about the opportunity just to make it clear, correct? Yes, $1.3 billion is the opportunity that we see ahead. If the countries that, that we are counting here can adopt policies to use these digital technologies to the max. So it is billions, right? It is 1.3 billion. So Yolanda has been here for a while and we want to ask you something with regards to what you're listening to. Welcome as a responsible for the GovStack initiative. Before you speak about it and what it implies to the region, what are your first opinions or comments that you may have? Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this meeting, in this conversation that I think is very interesting. I am all for digital transformation. I think Latin America in the last decade has taken the digital transformation as a government policy, and we can see this reflected in the fact that over 90% of countries in the region have a digital agenda as part of their national plan. This is very important because it allows us to articulate the local ecosystems with regards to priorities. This means that the institutional capability has also been strengthened. We can see ITC agencies, ITC ministries, that are instances that are responsible of articulating digital policies to define standards when it comes to designing services, interoperability, management of data, and how investments in technology are guided. 
And we also think it's very important to see the priority and the boom that was given to digital channels. This, due to the pandemic, we have seen that they were very innovative uh, agendas to emit, for example, the COVID certificate so that you could easily and quickly uh, take flights. There was a boom when it came to using mobile devices for uh, electronic transfers and to be able to support many families through uh, transfer services that were effective. And we also saw an explosion in the use of digital media for the development of skills and to be able to continue with learning processes. So I think what we've learned in the pandemic and this explosion that has come about due to the massification of the use of AI has focused once again on the fact that our countries have these agendas. These agendas were built before the COVID pandemic. And now, as Eleonora says, all of the countries are have are having consultative consultative processes to speak about main issues, not only about guaranteeing universal access to broadband and the internet, but also when it comes to rights. So that speaks about how, the fact that the digital transformation has become a government policy and how we have instances that are responsible for satisfying the agenda when it comes to these issues. America, Latin America, through instances such as the digital agenda articulated through CEPAL, for example, works with a mechanism of planning that is um, seen through the uh, electronic government network and the electronic signature, for example, the digital signature to have trade, for example, and when it comes to import and export certificates, this is something that has been worked on for many, many years with the different trade organizations. What are the areas for opportunities? We should not lose the momentum. We must strengthen the policies for governance of data. We must strengthen the mechanisms and the progression of standards, which is something that we work on on GovStack so that all of our public digital infrastructures are safe, so we respect the sovereignty and the autonomy of countries. And at the same time, we build uh, with common standards that allow the exchange of information in a safe way. And this is key to have a good digital transformation based on data. Uh, then when it comes to sustainability, we have just launched a communication report together, a guide with the World Bank. When it comes to green data, we've also published a guide to see about procurement when it comes to information, when it comes to sustainability. So the advantage of the digital area is that it um, consumes quite a bit of resources as so we must have a sustainability policy in place. So big advances, but we must also capitalize on these to be able to strengthen the capabilities in institutional terms in each of the countries. I'm going to challenge you a bit because Bill's comment with regards to the macro environment and the three areas that he mentioned has asked for more ambition in the region, not just to see where we are and whether we are satisfying the minimum. If we want to be more ambitious when you're speaking about an articulate vision for the private sector and the public sector, when we're talking about access, for example, for the internet uh, and the fact of widening the inequality gap, for example, and this articulation between the private and the public sector, if we had to be ambitious in the next six months, what is it that we need to do as a journalist? I want to know. Okay, so you're saying we are getting to a specific place, but due to what Bill Maloney has said, this context expects us as authorities to be a bit more ambitious. What does this mean in the region to do what? Who would like to begin? 
es una excelente pregunta, totalmente fuera de la agenda. Es una agenda. Rápidamente una, una respuesta, pero yo creo que hay... I'm going to think of an answer, but I think an abstract that has to do with human capital development. As Gil was saying, this is not magic. You don't just connect and have economic growth. You must invest in our human capital in order to take it to the next level. This implies two things. In the first place, to close the access gaps to these digital skills that still exist, for example, the gender gap, which is very, very huge in our region, and that must uh, ask both the private and the public sector to do something about it, and then to develop our human capital for future jobs or even present jobs. So these two dimensions are very important when it comes to articulating the public sector and the private sector. Uh, a figure that really um, made me think uh, on the report of the World Bank this week, just 28% of the population in the region has digital basic skills, 64% uh, in the uh, countries that are more developed. This is a report, uh, and this figure has to really worry us. Another thing that has really taken me aback is that 38% of the population live with mobile um, coverage, but they choose not to use it. And they say that cost is the main obstacle. So these are factors that are also have to do with being able to use the technology. And we were speaking about the gender gap, which is something that for me is very important as a woman who works in technology. And I would like to add, according to the exec, four out of 10 women have problems accessing technology. Access and digital skills is what they lack. So this means that women are less prepared and they reduce their possibilities of accessing well-paid jobs as well. So this has a multiplying effect due to the lack of digital skills. What can we do for us? This is a fundamental pillar, not just the announcement that we made last year uh, of our investment in the region, but also the work that we had been carrying out already from 2017. We have trained thanks to our programs uh, and donations from Google, all 8 million people were trained in digital skills throughout the region. And recently, this year, we gave over 7,000 scholarships to access career certificates in some countries in the region so that people would have access to training that would allow them to participate in areas of the technological job market, data, machine learning, cybersecurity, and others. And I am very proud about the initiatives that we're carrying out to empower the women in the region, many together with the civil society, and some also in partnerships with the governments. This year, for example, we had the opportunity to travel to the north of Argentina to get to know projects that will be funded thanks to a contribution from Google of a million dollars with women to offer digital skills and also financial skills for women in vulnerable areas. We're working with an organization in the region that is very powerful called Promujer. And to finish off, we have spoken, spoken a lot about AI, but it's very important to be ready to be able to make the most of AI and to be able to make the most of the opportunities that AI brings with it to our region, not only to generate many products and services that nowadays are powering, for example, when it comes to our company products and services that we use daily, but also for companies and also to be able to use products and services that will allow us to approach problems with social relevance, for example, climate change or issues to do with health. It is very difficult not to be so excited about the possibilities of AI, but as we said before, we must develop the human capital to be able to make the most of it and work jointly with the private sector, public sector, so civil society and ourselves to be able to, from Google, for us, it is vital to approach AI from a bold perspective, but also reliable and responsible. Uh, so, 
AI is a game changer in the use of technologies, plus the challenges that we have with connectivity are very important. And we must all face these challenges. Thank you, Eleonora. Of course, we think that the opportunity of 4% of the saving in the GDP, what else can we do? When you speak practical, what do you do with this? In practical terms, we must prioritize good practices when it comes to designing services. Today, we can apply methodologies to transform how people interact with the government. When we talk about design of services, we mean articulating all of the efforts of putting uh, things online. This is one of the biggest challenges in the public sector because administration is not used to working on this. So we, when we talk about processes or procedures to bring uh, the entrepreneur or the citizen uh, forth, we can help productivity. This affects corruption as well. So in order to accelerate the process of facilitating business is very important. We have to redesign services so that we can simplify processes in a significant way thanks to interoperability. The fact that today a person can do processes without going physically to a, an office. This is something that could be worked on now because many countries are already using it in the region. What do they mean? What do they need for escalability? They need to have common standards. If we do have today a mechanism for identity, why should this only be used in the government? The same mechanism should be used for identifying the person when it comes to companies and when you go to the bank anywhere in the country to be able to keep growing when it comes to coverage of financial services. I need to be able to be more efficient when it comes to using the infrastructure and when it comes to interoperability ecosystems, the same standards that enable the government to use these are the same ones that should be used in the public sector and also digital services under those standards. And this is to do with what we do in GovStack, which is technical specifications based on standards of interfaces of apps, APIs, which help governments to use these technical specs to develop their digital components, which are basic, and to be able to accelerate this process, so to digitalize services. Before, most ministries would develop ad hoc systems. Each system had a different way of identifying users, a way of making payments, etc. But when this began to be exponential, it was, it was not there were not enough financial resources to allow for these type of processes to, to be able to invest technologically in articulating this effort of investment and use of these big blocks or technological blocks is vital to be able to reach scale and to simplify it when it comes to giving services to citizens. Thank you, Yolanda. I want to get Bill Maloney to give us the final remarks uh, and, as I say, to mobilizing this way of acting, of doing with the urgency that we have in the region when it comes to time lost and what we must do to be able to improve the situation for millions of people. Millions of people. Thank you, everyone, for your fruitful reflections. Yolanda said, said two important things. First is that we have a great deal of opportunities, but we cannot lose our momentum. It's not enough. We just wire connections, but there are several complementary things 
we need to rethink how are we doing things. This includes establishing standards for interoperability between ministers and other entities. This is crucial. And I believe that if we're going to attempt to use digital technology in education or in the health sector, we need to rethink how have we designed these systems not to end up uh, doing something wrong. So I believe this uh, message is very important, the complementarity. Eleonora highlighted also important opportunities. The digital technologies may lead us uh, to difficulties if we are not cautious. So it's very important to be inclusive, to include everyone. 38% of people live in places where they have connectivity, but maybe they're not interested. So there's a process of socialization and education that we need to promote. Most of these people are women, and this implies that they need to uh, receive the necessary education to harness these technologies for the future, to develop the necessary skills, to precisely reduce this gap between genders. So the whole thing about human capital is absolutely vital, both for the acceleration of growth, but also to make sure that we are uh, moving together to this new dimension. Excellent. Thank you, Bill Maloney. And I just wanted to say, if you want to know more about this report, Connected Technologies for Inclusion and Growth, that was presented yesterday, you may download it. And the address at the bottom of your screen, I want to thank Bill, Eleonora, and Yolanda, and all of you for having listened to this conversation. My name is Gabriela Frias. See you next time.